Right, so we turned up to this morning's job and it was supposed to be a nice little straightforward job and we would get a little video and give you an introduction to getting a job ready for a coloured through render. So putting the base coat on, putting the mesh and putting the beads on. But nothing ever goes to plan, does it? <laughs> so we ended up, I mean, straight away we started chopping the, chopping the render off and the background wasn't what we thought it was. Now I'd already bought all the base coats we had to change that out. We had to swap things. Right. Oh, look, I'll, let's just get into it. I'll show you what happened. I was going to scrap the video and I thought, do you know what? No, I'm going to show you me the new thought process and the new things that we had to do instead. So let's get, just get straight into it. So when we got to the job, we started chopping off the render and discovered it was a lightweight block in the background, which we didn't expect. So things oh, all went to pot. Right, so here's a little introduction for you. For K rend or any sort of coloured rendered for getting the base coat ready. Now we chop this off, and to our surprise, we've got a thermalite block underneath. Not just I thought it'd be just standard, standard like breeze block or concrete block or something, but we've got thermalites. So with thermalite block, you can't use your standard HP12 base coat or your standard base. Um, I recommend using HP12 for most things, but anyway. When you have a thermalite, you've got to use HBX. Um, it's what it's what KREN specified, so that's it's just great stuff. To be fair, it's like, it's uh, absolutely horrendous to use, but it sticks like no one's business. That's the gear. Like I say, it's horrendous to use, but it is good stuff. Anyway, first thing we're going to do is, before we go any further, we're going to set the beads on. So we're going to use 15 mil beads. There's a joint here between the block work and the brickwork, and it's not tied in. So I know this is always going to crack, just like the render before, the last time I spent render. So instead of just rendering straight up to there, and it cracking, and some bits of the render sticking to this brick, and some here, and then being an unsightly crack, I'm going to put stop beads up the edges of it. And then we've got the opportunity and later on to silicon down the back of the stop bead to seal that gap. A bit like an expansion gap. If you ever go over two different backgrounds, two parts where walls meet, you've got to put an expansion gap because it will crack. You can put triple mesh on, you can mesh it five times. Trust me, it will crack. So this is similar, although we're not going to render onto this, we're going up to it. So we're going to put a, a stop bead down there, just one side, so that, it, that the wall, this wall can move and it's not going to... Have an unsightly crack. Is that enough talking about flipping cracks anyway? Come on, just get on with it. Now, as you've just seen then, I like to use an angle grinder for cutting plastic beads. One, because you can cut them in situ, you haven't got to try and move them, you can just cut straight through whatever it is. So if the bead's on the wall and you want to shave it back, you want to adjust it, you can use um, the angle grinder. I've actually done a full video on beading up, so I'm not going to go on too, too much about it now. In fact, I'll just, at the end of this video, I will make sure that there's a, a link for the video on beading. So if you, if you want to know more about cutting the beads, then watch that. But basically, the main reason for using this is it's easier. It's easier to use an angle grinder. And as well, when you're cutting these beads, sometimes, depending on what, what brown beads you've got, sometimes this plastic's very brittle and your tin snips will shatter the plastic and it's a pain in the ass. So angle grinder is the way forward. A number of ways you can put the beads on. You can go around and nail them on. I've used pink grip in the past, um, or you can bed them on. But if you bed them on, use the base coat. Don't whatever you do, use drywall adhesive. I remember the job once. Some lads started using drywall adhesive. Oh my fucking god! It was like, oh, just never do that. All right, you have no end of problems. Just use the base coat that you put in the same the same stuff as what you're going to use for the rest of the job. Right mate, that was the spirit level please, Kira. 
Leute. You got me. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure you clean off underneath your beads, your bell casts, especially if you can see underneath them. Doesn't matter, I suppose, too bad if it's, you know, only two courses high or three courses high at the bottom of the wall because you can't really see under them. But these sort of places, you make sure that there's no base coat just hanging down. Get it whilst it's wet because it's a nightmare. Especially this HPX stuff, it doesn't break off that easy, so it's easier to get it off whilst it's wet now. Damper, so it sits on top of the bell cast nice. Right, once you've got all your beads sort of set in, it's time to get your mesh on, so you need to give it a bit of a coat over first, so you've got something to bed it into. And a little tip for you as well, our bell cast bead above the window kept sliding down, look at me, how oh, feet I am. <laughs> that kept dropping down, and um, because of where it's situated, there was nothing to sort of get a nail into to keep it still. So what I've done is I've put a band of um, back coats higher above it and then I've bedded a strip of meshing that goes over the bead and what that does is it just sort of grabs the bead to the wall and stops it sliding down you know if you can get a little tack in it just if, if that ever happens to you and you know, it's ever slipping down you can get a little tack you know just to hold it still you can take the tack out once it's set or you can just do it like that just put a bit of mesh across it to hold it still for yourself Right, the thing with this HPX is it picks up and gets a skin on it quite quick. So what you want to do is go so so far, you know, about a metre, and get your, your drops of mesh in. Just do it like hanging wallpaper, it's not the easiest way of doing it. Now, ideally, here it helps me with this bit, so I don't have to put my fingers in it, and I can just do it with my trowel. But he's busy filming, so half a minute. like this now where the mesh isn't cut straight just put extra little strips in wherever needed you know a bit there and a bit there we're using the same pink mesh so unfortunately for us krend won't guarantee it because we haven't used their mesh but their mesh is twice as expensive it's exactly the same 160 grams per square meter and strength it's the same strength and they always say on theirs it's alkaline resistance which just basically means it's been um, soaked in what did they put it in acrylic silicon it's soaked in something i'll remember um this is as well so this is just quite fine what you'll find is as well hey rend no offense to them you know they, they do a great product but they say you have to use each of their every part of their product for each part of the system and if you don't then they won't give you a warranty but the thing what you'll find is even if you did and um, they'll ask you if you're a krend approved applicator which means if you've been away to one of their training courses and if you haven't then basically that's their get out of jail free card if you ever have a problem on your job but if you do it you know properly and you follow the spec then you won't have problems anyway so nice you want to overlap your mesh by a good distance, you know, about four or five inches is enough. Stay. is once we've got you know a good section on then I'll go back over this mesh again with another pass and we'll check it and make sure that we're not out in front of the beads you know we'll get a bit of a string line from bead to bead and we'll go right down the wall and make sure that everything is back behind the beads so we don't have any issues of scraping through to the back coat when we put the top coat on
Now, what I was trying to say before is that K-Rend advertised their mesh as alkaline resistance. Now, this pink mesh that I'm using is also alkaline resistance. What it basically means is it's got a, a latex coating over the fiberglass cloth. All that basically boils down to is that the cement won't start eating into the fiberglass over time and just deteriorates the mesh when it's inside the wall. Now, this HPX base coat is specifically designed for problem backgrounds like Thermalite Block. The main problem with it is though, it's absolutely crap to use. It sticks to your tools. It drags when you're trying to put it on. Normal base coats, K-Ren base coat is lovely to put on and HP12 isn't too bad either. HP just stands for higher polymer. And the more polymers that are in your base coat, the more flexible it is and the more sticky it is. Make sure the face of all your beads are cleaned down when you base coat. This isn't too bad because it's it's a lighter colour. Uh, HP12, the usual base coat. I mean, it's normally like a grey cementy colour. And um, even if even if you try and get it off when it's set, it'll still stain the beads. So it's much easier. Just go around and make sure they're all nice and clean. The bits that are going to be shown. And as well, gives you a chance to check all the corners and make sure everything. Is meeting up like this corner here for some reason keeps pulling back in it needs to be more there so what i'll do is once the beads are clean we'll get a little bit of duct tape and tape the corners together till it sets right once you're done you've cleaned your beads down you've checked there's no bits sagging out there's no lumps you know make sure go over beads and make sure that you've got clearance that none of your base coat is sticking out in front of your beads. Then, time to put the key in. Now you can either scarify it or scratch it. <coughs> the idea of this is it isn't to put big lines in it like that. That isn't what this is supposed to do. This is supposed to just tear the surface open and this is too wet for that. So I won't be scarifying it. Instead, you don't need your you key really deep with this because the last thing you want to do is put it in deep and cause it to fall forwards like um, like I do with me sort of sand and cement. So nice light scratches, nothing too deep, just horizontal like this. I'm making sure that I'm not causing the back coat to stick out, you know. Now, some people will say to you, you should give it wavy scratches, yeah, and you've probably, I've got other videos on scratching sand and cement, and what it does is when you do the wave like this, it causes a, a droop in the, in the render one way or another way, so when the top coat goes on, it actually like um, dovetails into the base coat, so I know about that, but that isn't what I'm trying to do here, I don't want this sort of falling away to, to make it, you know, a slot behind it, because we'll be out in front of the beads, and when we scrape it back, the base coat will show, so I'm paying attention just to lightly scratch it now see this little bit of bead here yeah you could leave that you know it, it's not the end of the world but i like them to be absolutely perfect now it needs to sort of be there it needs about that so it meets up lovely but it won't seem to stay there so what i'm going to do is put some tape around the back there get it where i want it and tape it on like that now, once this is set to model, you just take them back off and them corners will, won't move, they'll be solid. I'm going to do it on the other side as well. Okay, this one isn't too bad to be fair, but you know, I have moved it a couple of times, so I'm just going to make sure it stays where I want it. So I'm going to just do it anyway. That's it. Sound. Okay. Oh, in case you're looking at me thinking, flipping that Kurt, you're a messy worker. We've sort of, this is a tiny little job, we've sort of left this down accidentally on purpose because any of this stuff that drops, you know, it catches on here. And as well, this is a tiny little job for us, so we're well on top of it. If you were doing sort of a bigger job, you might want to go around and put window protectors on and all that, but you know, Kieran 
he's basically here today just getting paid for watching me so he's got plenty of time to wipe things down and clean up as we go so that's the reason there's a bit of crap still on the floor and that's the reason the windows aren't covered just because Kieran's here on that so This mesh is going to go on long ways, so I'm just getting it ready. It's like putting wallpaper on. Oh, here. There we are, there. Not naming any names, but someone hasn't done the neatest job of cutting this. So, any little bits that are sort of left with no left covering, i.e., you know, a little bit there at the bottoms, we're just going to cut some little strips and go round and overlap them. You know, we're going to overlap them a good, a good bit there. Okay, just whilst we're talking about protecting the ground as well, there's a few ways you can do it. So, I know for this little job that this is going to be. Fine, we're going to clean up once we've got this on, that'll be it sorted. Now when you're putting the top coat on, if around the house has all been landscaped already and it's all perfect, you might want to consider putting dust sheets down at the bottom of the walls. Now there's a few options with you. In the past, we've put tarps down, um, waterproof tarps, or you can use this screen, and lip, the, up, lip it up the wall a little bit and pin it to the wall. So you look up to here. Yeah. And then, to stop you slipping on that, put some um, put some plywood on top of it, or some OSB boards, or some sheets of something, so you can walk on it, and the scaffolding can go, can go up on top of that. That's one option. If you do that, though, you can't start washing down with water everywhere, because it'll cause pools of water on the tarps, and it'll mix with the top coat, and it'll run through, and basically you'll end up stains underneath your, underneath your sheets. So be careful of that. My preferred method is to use cloth dust sheets, you know, fold them in up like four times and lay them around the bottom of the walls. At the end of the day, go around, pick them all up, and then go around, you know, hosing and brushing down. That seems to be about the best way, although it's a bit labour intensive because every day you've got to clean up. Um, or, you know, you can just do this. Mm. I mean, I wouldn't do this right round someone's whole house, but for this little job, this is fine. So just to clarify, we've purposely left all the rubble on the floor just to save time because kevin has got to clean it up and then if I drop stuff, he's got to clean that up as well. So it's just easier that anything I drop lands on the rubble and then we only have to clean up once. k will give you specific thicknesses that they want things on. Your base coat, you know, four mil thick and things like that. But if you've done it this way, if you put your mesh on and bedded it in and put another coat on top, you'll be about right. Some fellas have cut the mesh and held it in place and sort of bedded it on. I don't think that's the best way of doing it. I don't think it sticks as well. I think putting a coat on first, bedding your mesh into it, it's still wet behind you, see that'll still stick to it when this top layer pushes it in. This is the best way, the, the mesh is encased. It's not on the very surface and it's not on the very back. It's encased within the base coat. So I want to tell you, when you're rendering, you want to be working from right to left, if you're right-handed. And the reason being is this, if you're skimming the wall as a right-handed person, I'd start there and I'd work my way along this way, yeah? Because each time, the heel leaves a line in your finishing plaster, doesn't it? So you're overlapping your heel line. But when you're rendering, you're coming back the other way. And the reason is because if you're putting on any sort of thickness, the stuff, the stuff has a tendency to drop off again. So when you're going right to left, as you're putting it in, that top bit where you're coming off the wall, you're tying the stuff into the last stroke so it doesn't fall off as much. You just end up dropping less, working right to left. And as well, any plasterer that knows what he's doing that spots you, I mean, they'll know if you're going the wrong way round or not. So, you know, just save yourself any embarrassment. Work right to left when you're rendering. Now, the only thing that I've sort of missed out, because this was such a small job, was stress points around windows and weak points in the structure. So let's just say, for instance, we're just going to base coat the whole front of this house. Yeah, and you're putting your, your, 
your strips are meshing like this, you know, and you put another strip above the window here, and you know, you, you're overlapping them, sorry, like this, you know, and you're working your way across, overlapping your mesh, putting big strips of it down. I'm not doing a very good job of this. <laughs> My pen doesn't work how I want it to. But what I'm trying to get to is, you're putting your, your mesh in, you know, you'd start from the top, you'd be putting bands of mesh up here as well. Now, this is the bit I'm trying to get to. Once you've meshed the whole wall, all these corners of every window is a stress point. This is where it's prone to cracking all these areas. So what you do is get your roller mesh and cut yourself some strips off and put some diagonal pieces like this over all the corners. Yeah, so you're doubling the mesh up and you're putting it on a diagonal over what you've already put on. So it's double meshed. Does that make sense? And what you're doing is just reinforcing all the weak points on the wall. It takes a bit more time. A lot of fellas don't do it. But if you get a crack in your render, then you wish that you did do it. Not saying that mesh, nothing is a guarantee. That, you know, if a house subsides, you're going to get a hairline crack. There's nothing you can do. If that house moves, the render will crack. But look, when you, when you, that's the cost of this stuff, the cost of buying it and the cost of putting it on, for the sake of putting a few extra bits of mesh on, just, just do it. It's not worth the hassle not doing it. Now, if this was a, let me just clean that off so you can see. If this was a massive job um, and we were doing the full house, maybe the gable and stuff, I'd have the feather edge out checking the base coat for straightness. Unfortunately, this HPX doesn't take very well to um, hitting it with the derby. Once it starts to pick up a little bit, if you try and hit it with another go over the trowel or you try and rule it or do anything with it, it just starts to tear and slide off. So you've got to sort of leave it, get it on as sort of as flat as you can, and then um, you know if check it as it's going off. And if if there's hollows or anything like that, then go back and build it up. But you're not going to be able to rule it flat. You'll more just have to sort of let it pick up a little bit and then put your feather edge on it and just check it all over and make sure it's nice and anywhere that needs any more attention then you can give it more attention. Um, ideally, the, the way would be um, to daub out first any big holes and gouges in the wall, which I did sort of have um, from when we chopped the render off. But I know that when the mesh goes on, it sort of stops any sagging of the stuff, like the stuff will sag out of the deep parts. As soon as you sort of mesh it, that sort of stops. So I've... I'm confident that that's fine. I've sort of um, I've checked it around all the beads with me level to make sure I'm string line to make sure that the render's back behind all the beads. So we're good to go. That is how I get a base coat ready. Now, I know it's only a little job, and I've got some bigger jobs lined up, and I'll show you some bigger stuff. But for now, I can only I can only make videos on the jobs that I'm on. Can't I? I can't just start um, creating more work for myself just for you guys to see the video. There you go, and any dust off the bags anywhere, make sure you wash it all away. Because if you leave it, even though it's not mixed up, it's just dust, that morning dew will set it and you'll stay in the driveway or the road or wherever. So make sure you wash everything down when you're finished. So that's how I get a through coloured render job ready, or a scrape render, or a monocouche render, or a K render, or a Weber, or whatever whatever your product you're using. But that's how I get them jobs ready. Uh, there was a big change to plan. I thought it was just going to be like um, standard block work behind, but we discovered that it was a high-performance, lightweight thermalite block, which had a pain in the ass really. So we had to go and switch the base cowl out. I had to go back to the builder's yard and change it out. I usually use, for everything, HP12, higher polymer 12, K-Ren base coat, fantastic for pretty much everything. But if I'm going over thermite block, then it's just better to be safe than sorry and use the HPX base coat. As I said in the video, it is a pig to use. It's flipping horrible. It sticks to everything. It drags, it sags. It's just horrible to use, but it's fantastic at sticking to problem backgrounds, um, especially high suction backgrounds as well. Again, one of the main problems with it is, as, as I just said before, it's very hard to derby it or to rule it off because what it does is, as it starts to pick up, as it starts to, to set, it gets like a skin on the top that goes off first and the middle of it is still soft. So 
what I'm trying to say is when you try and rule it, it like sticks to your rule, the skin on the surface, and it just slides it off. It just rips the stuff open. So it doesn't take very well to be ruled or derbied or anything. You've just got to try and get it on as flat as you can. Now, as I said to you, if that was a massive wall, then I'd be checking it out as it's going off. I'd go round with a feather edge rule, hold the rule and check for any hollows or any lumps. Lumps, you know, you just have to just work your magic, flick a bit of water on it to stop it sticking to your trowel and flatten them in. Hollows, build them up a little bit more. But unfortunately, HPX, you aren't going to be able to rule it off. Standard base coat, yeah, you can get your derby on it. If it, if it starts to stick, if it starts to drag, then just... Wet the back of your derby down. Keep the back of that derby wet and it won't stick as much. You can also um, get your spray bottle and mist the wall down and it'll derby round because they all seem to get a bit of a skin on them, these uh, higher polymer base coats. Uh, they're not quite like sand and cement. But anyway, I won't go on. That's how I get a job ready for three coloured render. And I was talking to you about setting beads up. Beading will be covered in this video here. There's a full tutorial on how to put beads on for K-Ren jobs or colour render jobs here because they've got to be spot on. I highly recommend that you watch this video. So actually press the screen, poke this video and watch it now. Trust me, you'll thank me that you've watched it because there's loads of valuable information in there.